Hi everyone, today we're going to be going over this 2019 15-inch uh, MacBook Pro A1990 that does not turn on. So there's a few things that we can tell by simply just plugging in the power adapter. So I'm going to get my USB-C cable with amp meter on the end and I want to make sure to plug in the battery as well. So on A1990s, uh, they will not boot, they will not post, they will not power on without a battery connected. So we have to connect a battery on this machine to even start diagnosing or checking voltages. If you have the battery unplugged and you start measuring stuff, everything's going to be out of whack because it really needs the battery plugged in. So, and a bad battery on these can actually present as the trackpad clicking but no power. So our battery's plugged in and connected. Let's go ahead and plug in our USB-C amp meter. Alright, so this is plugged in. We're getting 5 volts, 0.04 uh, milliamps, I believe this one on intake was uh, like at around 20 intermittently, um, but either way, that's not good. That's not what we're supposed to be getting. So, 5 volts, 0 milliamps could be a number of things. We could have an issue in the USB-C circuit. It might be in DFU mode. Uh, we might have a short on PP bus, so I'm going to start checking some voltages here. So, I want to check voltage on PP bus G3 hot. That's first on these and see what I'm getting here. And I'm getting 12.32 volts, which may mean a DFU issue, may not. So I want you guys to see this. There, 12.2, 12.5. So that's kind of already atypical for a DFU issue, but we're going to note that. Um, another quick thing I want to do, well, I guess right now we need to rule out if it's in DFU. So that's our very first thing we need to do. Now, we know we may possibly have a machine that's in DFU. We need to rule it out. So I'm going to bring this over here to my computer. I'm going to plug this in. And off screen, I'm going to check if it's in DFU. And it is not in DFU mode, so we have another issue. Now, what 12.3 volts means on these um, newer machines with the T2 chip is that the T2 is not communicating to the PMU or the um, ISL9240. So that might be a problem there. So the next thing we need to figure out what's going on in our power sequence. So I have a document here that lists all the power rails on the machine, and we're going to start going through those and checking to see where it's getting stuck at. All right, so here's our list of um, power rails. Um, in our machine. Now if you email me asking me where can you get schematics from, that should be an obvious hint of where you can get schematics from. Anyway, so we have PP bus at the top which we know is present. We have PP3V3, um, G3HRTC which is most likely going to be present. Let's just double check and see if that's actually there. So PP3V3, G3H underscore RTC, PP3V3 underscore 3H underscore RTC. Hopefully it's on this side of the board. I'm pretty sure it will be. Yes, so we can measure this on several different areas, but the best place is going to be at R6935 and R6934, which are two resistors right next to each other. So that's where I'm going to measure this. So let's go over to our microscope and we'll measure this. So these resistors are going to be right here. Of course, covered by there we go. So these are our two resistors. And let's see if we get 5 volts there. Now, typically, when there's a short on PP bus, PP bus will be 0 and can't power the circuit, so it won't work. We have 3.8 volts there, 3.38 volts there. So that's not going to be the issue. Now, what you could do is you could just go ahead and measure all of these guys. Now, I don't like to do that very much, I don't like to go through everything, so I'm going to skip around a little bit. So we see we have different power stages here. We have RTC, whatever, upper threshold. We don't need to understand that. But what I want to go down to is I want to check the bottom right here. Because each one of these is symmetrical. So not symmetrical. It's going to be in order. So you're not going to get like, you're not going to get PP1V8G3H without PP3V3G3H. Or you're not going to get, um, let's say, PP0V9 sleep DDR without PP3V3 awake. They're going to come in order, and that's why you have this uh, timing chart here of when this happens. So I'm going to go down to PMU cold reset L or PMU active ready. Either of these, uh, some of these are going to be not measurable because they're under the T2, but I'm going to go try to measure PMU active ready, and if there's no good spot to measure that, I will go to cold reset L. So PMU active ready is going to be on RK027. So I'll go back over. 
Uh, you guys don't need to see it. You guys know I'm telling the truth and where I'm measuring. Anyway, I'm going to measure this. It's going to be over on this no stuff resistor. Here's my meter. And I'm going to plug in our board. It's always important to plug in your board if you want to actually measure stuff and have it make sense. All right. So it's 1.8. Okay, this is an interesting behavior. So it's 1.7 and it cycles. So it's coming online and then it's shutting off. Now, that's that's interesting because that's not something that we typically see on these boards. We don't typically see um, a rail coming online and then shutting off. It usually doesn't work that way the, on these boards. That's something we used to see a lot on the pre T2 pre boards and they were shorts. But that's pretty rare on but on this board. So we know we have a problem there. It's cycling, but we need to go down our list and figure out what's going on. So the next one I want to jump to is going to be PP5VG3SEN. So this is another common failure point when the T2 is not talking to the PMU, right? Um, that that PP5VG3SEN will be missing because this comes from the T2 and PMU and they have to both talk to each other uh, really closely in order for that to happen. So PP3, PP5VG3SEN will show up around our TPS uh, 51280, which will be over here, so U7650. So I know where this is from experience, but obviously if you're new to this, look up where it comes from on the board. It's not hard to do. So anyway, I'm going to check this enable, which is going to show up on a resistor right near the TPS 51980A. And that is, okay, three volts. And cycling again, okay, so that's weird. So we're at least we're getting this far. We know if we're getting that far, we have all the rails prior to that are doing the same thing. They're coming on, they're trying. So after PP5V G3S EN, we have PP5V G3S. So G3S is an always present G3. It's te technically just G3 hot. Ask an Apple engineer why they change to S, I don't know. But anyway, let's measure what PP5V G3 hot is, or G3S. That will show up on C8162. Now, I want you to, to think about something here. On all the rails that we've measured prior, what were they? They were at their normal voltages. So when we're measuring a line that might be shorted or something, we'll typically get a lower voltage than what it actually is. So like this, the, the enable signal here is going to be a 3.3-volt signal. It's cycling up to 3.3 volts really quickly. It's really hard to see, but it is actually getting there. Now if we measure PP5VG3S, it's not getting anywhere close to 5 volts. It's getting less than a half of a volt a tenth of a volt. Now this is a pattern to recognize. Typically power cycling like this is caused by a short somewhere. Um, it could also be caused by data or clock issues. So a hint when you hit a shorted line is like if something's like five, supposed to be five volts and you're only getting like a tenth of a volt or something, that may very well be your issue. So if you come across something like that, that is the rail you're going to want to measure for short. Um, if it's still, if it was still five volts, then you could proceed and go downstream to find out what's actually going on. But let's measure that now for short. Put my multimeter in diode mode here. So it's in diode mode. One lead on ground, one lead on 5VG3S. Oh, look at that, 0, 0.0. So we have a dead short to ground on PP5VG3S. So now we know where our problem is. So what's going on, so thinking about what the board's doing. So what's going on is it's trying to turn on. Something on PP5VG3S is pulling way too much current, so the PMU is saying no, or the TPS 15, uh, 51980 is saying that can't happen, and it shuts it off. So it's a protection circuit, and it retries to see if it's still there, and it just gets an endless loop. Anyway, let's get this board out, and then um, we will inject voltage and use our thermal and see where the short actually is. All right, our board is out. Um, let me just solder a wire to 5VG3S real quick. It's going to show up on... Um, I believe this capacitor right here. Let me just double check this guy, one of these guys at the top. Yeah, PP5VG3S, either or, one of these. Just double check that our short is in the enclosure because you never know if something outside of the enclosure is causing an issue from subrail, whatever. Diode mode.
Yep, zero. Okay, so this is 5VG3S. Um, I'm going to get my power supply, and we're going to we'll start out at about a volt and go up from there, but I think a volt should be plenty sufficient to show where our issue is. All right, let's get a little bit of fresh leaded solder on this cap just to make it easier. Just like that. Be hilarious if this was the cap that was shorted. I've actually had that happen before where you solder a wire under the cap to the actual shorted component. And this is a fresh jumper wire, so we gotta burn off that coating. There, it doesn't have to be perfect. And now we're going to get our thermal and see what gets hot. So let me grab my thermal imager and we'll switch over to the thermal cam view. All right, we have our thermal camera on our board. Let's go ahead and see what's going to get hot here. So we're going to connect our ground lead to one of the grounding points on the board. There's a few good places on this. Um, and we are pulling about an amp. So let's just see if we see anything getting remotely warm. Okay, there we go. There we go. All right, wonder what this is. This looks like a capacitor. So we'll zoom in for a little bit higher res. Look at that. That's definitely a tantalum capacitor there. So now we know what it is. I can go ahead and up the voltage a little bit just to see this little guy get even hotter. And there you go. Look at that temp climb. So we definitely know where our fault is now. So we go ahead and shut this off. Let's go ahead back to our microscope view and let's get this cap off the board and replaced. All right, we could see it was definitely this tantalum capacitor on the left here. So let's go ahead and get this guy off. This rubber covering off of here so it doesn't melt. I hate the smell of melted rubber. Come on. There we go. Let's see if we could see it. It jumped. Jumping capacitor. Anyway, let's see if it's cracked. No, it doesn't look too bad, but that capacitor really wants to jump. It really wanted to get off that board, as you could tell. Let's go ahead and check for a short again. Always best after you remove a shorted component or what you suspect is a shorted component to test and see if it's gone. And it is gone now. We had 0.0 in diode mode. I'm gonna use resistance now because it's more accurate after the fact and we now have about 500 ohms, which that sounds a little bit low to me, but the board is still hot, so I'll give that a pass. Um, Let's see here. Let's do it one more time. Yeah, so it's climbing. It's just because the board is warm, but 5VG3S, that, that should be all right. Um, let's go ahead and take off our um, wire we use for finding the short. Little flux in here. like that, like that, good as new. And now we will put our replacement capacitor here. Let's get a little bit of flux. Let's grab our donor board. When removing the tantalums uh, from your donor board, kind of move in on them slow because if you go too quick at them, they will crack and that's not what you want. Should be good. We are going to let it cool for a second and clean this up, and then we'll see if this works. 
So while that's cooling down, I'll clean this area up. Let's get our flux out of here. That should be good. Now let's get this back in the enclosure and see if it works. All right, now for a moment of truth, we have our board back in with everything connected. Um, plug in our amp meter, let's see what happens. So we are at five volts, 0 0.22, 20 volts, 0 0.86, and that is a fan spin and that is an Apple logo. And let's see if this boots. I wanna cover up the customer's name. If it pops up. But this should be booting. Come on, give me a progress bar. There it is. It's booting into recovery, I'm sure. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, as always, it's going to be booting into recovery. All right, so as usual, like I said, it was in recovery mode. Um, now, why that happens is it probably shut off during boot when it died originally. And on any of these new machines, when you when you shut them off during boot, they always boot into recovery the next time around. But anyway, this is fixed. Um, all working good. We'll reassemble this, test it, and get this back to the customer. So thank you for watching, and I hope this video helps you in some way if you come across a similar problem.